Thank you so much for the great introduction and the opportunity to join this amazing gathering. I have had um, an immersion course in what it's like to be in Ohio. And I have to say, I have been so pleasantly surprised with every encounter and every exposure to both the formal learning and the informal learning. And I'm hoping that my comments are partnering with what you're doing, but I also hope that I can elevate some of the questions that you have in the context of questions that I'm going to share with you. Because the work that we're all involved with doesn't come with fixed answers. Some of the the experiences that we're sharing are the points of discovery for how we can do our work better and more effectively. So that's where that point of accountability will come in. So I'm going to start with where I sit within the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration from this point on known as SAMHSA. I am in the Office of Behavioral Health Equity which was newly established through the Affordable Care Act. Many of you may have heard of us, but I bet more of you have not. And for that reason, I elevate this particular point in SAMHSA because it is a centralized point within the agency that allows the unique needs of racial, ethnic minority groups, other populations that we know are vulnerable for negative health outcomes to come to the forefront. This is a place where we focus every day on issues related to data, policy, communication strategies, workforce development needs, and then we have this other category called customer service. And sometimes customer service looks like this, where I come out and I have the opportunity to be with states and communities to share um, points of common knowledge and, and understanding, but also to share points where there's innovation and new ways of doing business. Customer service also comes along with the routine bureaucratic responsibilities that we all have in our offices. So it's a way in which we can say, no matter what the need is, we are here to do our best to meet the need and go beyond that. So for today, I wanna to start where I hope we end up because time will run away and I will go on and, and you will also need to move forward. And it's with a question. The way I framed my, my comments for today, there will be questions that I ask and there will be time for questions from you and in that way, I'm trying to make this session interactive. It's really a, a challenge when you have a room this size to make it a conversation, but I'm hoping it is that. And I want to start with this. What if behavioral health equity was a starting point for decision-making and innovation? Just that simple question. How would that impact the way you think who you work with, what work you would be doing, and the roles of the people who need to benefit from your efforts. This moves us into a conversation that stretches any professional identity we have and obligates us to think about what actually determines health? And where does that fit in terms of the priorities we've set working with communities across states, across the nation, ensuring that we are offering people, as you see from this list, opportunities for a peaceful existence, stable shelter, quality education, food that is going to promote health, not just offset hunger pains, income stability, 
looking at the environment, both built and natural. What are issues around transportation? Who's providing health care and what are they offering? And are we at the point of thinking forward about social justice and equity in terms of how that relates to health and how that relates to the health of all people? We know that communities are diverse and in that diversity, sometimes the answer looks differently. So we ask ourselves, why is it, if we understand what determines health, we understand that for different groups of people, that means different things. Why is it we have some communities that are filled with opportunities to be well, and we have other communities that struggle with that? If the conversation starts with a common goal of health equity, this slide would be vulnerable for deletion because we wouldn't have those distinctions. So because I'm a road warrior and sometimes work bleeds into the journey, this picture captures exactly where I think this conversation is going this afternoon. It's the bridge between health disparity and health equity. It's a journey, and it's an exciting journey, but a difficult one. So this is a snapshot where I was stuck in traffic, but of course, stuck in traffic on the interstate. So, you know, it's construction season and it's weekend time and all of a sudden you realize you're just standing there and your mind wanders. My mind wanders a lot. And I looked where trees were growing and I looked where trees were not growing. And it made me think about some of the communities that I'm working with and where people are healthy and thriving and where they're not. And I share this image with you because I'm sure many of you will also pass patches in the highway that look like this as a point of reflection as to what we can do differently. And within my office, this became our answer in part. In April of 2011, so it's several years ago, the Department of Health and Human Services issued its first action plan to reduce health disparities that are experienced by racial and ethnic minority groups. We've had other plans, you know there are many strategic efforts, but this was the first action plan that really required points of accountability across federal agencies to identify specific programs and specific outcomes, to include those programs and outcomes in the plan, which you can find online and, and see how well we're doing to help you do your work and help you have strong communities but it also allowed us to think collectively and collaboratively. So the plan is integrated in its framework and has strategies that allow us to leverage existing programs, which is very often what's required, where we all work. There's no, no new money, no new staff, no new resources, and a lot of need. Sound similar? Yeah. Well, we also had a surprise with the plan because the agencies had come together to give good ideas about which programs would be the best to include. There are some additional priorities that the secretary included. And the first priority required, required disparity impact statements. And as you see on the slide, right there by letter C, those are the directions we received. Not very extensive. So within about 45 to 60 days, we sat, talked, sat some more, talked some more, and said, what will this be for SAMHSA? Because it's very hard to move government quickly, as I'm sure no one here would argue, 
But at the same time, it's a requirement coming from the secretary. So since I sit in the middle of the agency, I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go. Another one of those. Not only is it unfunded, it's a mandate that's not optional. So we came up with a framework that says for all grantees, we are asking at the point of award to project who you intend to serve by race and ethnicity, gender and sexual orientation when available. But we also want you to identify who out of all those you intend to reach are gonna be most vulnerable for not benefiting from the work you do. And for those, we are considering the disparate population. We're using a framework of access, use, and outcomes. Because we needed something that we could measure, we needed something that we could translate across audiences, we needed something that we frankly could remember. So three things, very clear, access, use, outcomes. And we wanted to put all of this work in a context that was collaborative, collegial, iterative. How many times do we wait until the end of a grant period to look back and say, well, what did, it, what did we accomplish? Okay, well, five years later, it's a little late. So this strategy is embedded into whatever program is funded by SAMHSA, but also into the monitoring mechanisms. So by show of hands, do we have any SAMHSA grantees in the audience? Okay, next year, if I'm allowed to come back, we're gonna have more hands. But for those that are up, congratulations. And I'm hoping that you have also started this work and can help your colleagues in the room better understand what this is starting to look like. But along with the framework, whether you're funded or not funded, comes the opportunity to understand how the national class standards fits with this. So in this one slide, we have a number of policies that I want to just summarize that aren't as obvious. The first driver is the action plan for reducing health disparities. Within our strategy at SAMHSA, we've also leveraged the provision within the Affordable Care Act that looks at data collection. And there are standards that now give us the opportunity to disaggregate or to break down the data so it's not just broad groups of people, but we can begin to see how the work is affecting smaller groups. Very often that's where challenges are the greatest. We also see the national class standards. They were newly released in 2013 and framed in a way that we are looking at the impact of culture and language on health and health care. And for the first time, there was a very systematic way of making sure behavioral health, both mental health and substance use, was included in this framework so that we could ensure all populations would be able to receive information in a way that was aligned with their beliefs about what is helpful in a language that makes that conversation effective in a way that we could also influence the research community to talk about what the work really needs to be about and how the work is unfolding. So we get to all of that, which I said wasn't that long. It just seemed like the conversations were intense. And the question becomes, what's different? Because too often we talk a lot and nothing's changed or it's changed and it still feels the same. Well, hopefully that's not the experience now. So these are the three primary changes. And I've, I put the form on the left, right, depending on your perspective, um, not because I want you to read the slide, 
but this is on SAMHSA's website if indeed you are interested in applying for one of our grants or if you already have one. I suggest you go and look at the examples we have so it gives you an idea of how to frame the response because the response is required and it is aligned with the funding that comes with the program opportunity. But more than that, these disparity impact statements give us an opportunity to be more aware of who's vulnerable. It al allows us to think about what resources need to be available and if they are not, how do we change that? And then to really systematically look at the data that gives us information about outreach, engagement, retention, and intervention. Because these are the points at which we feel success will be evident over time. We also know that when we take all of that into the prevention world that's framed by SAMHSA, it could feel like, here they go with another new thing. That was not the intent. So this little graphic that probably looks similar to something coming out of preschool with the primary colors blending is not that. This is really a reflection of continuity. It's a way in which we are thinking forward about all the good work you're doing with the strategic prevention framework. We don't want to lose that. We want to elevate that. We want to elevate it within this framework that's looking at access, use, and outcomes so that we better understand the impact of your work, not only for the benefit of the communities that you're involved with, but also at a federal level so that we can change the narrative around how well this work is serving the people of our country. So we've taken the strategic prevention framework, broken it down, and we've aligned it with our framework for disparities and, and the reduction of those disparities, and then looked at specific activities not only as an exercise, because we begin to see how they dovetail, but also to say, there's technical assistance available for this. Because we know it's not easy. It's not always intuitive to think about different populations and how they may need to receive prevention messages differently. Sometimes others who have expertise in that area, whether it be from a media perspective, a communication strategist, a linguist, you may need additional resources. So we do have support for you. And I, I bring this here only so that it escalates the doing, but that you're doing it in partnership. And then I wanted to start to deconstruct our framework. I wanna deconstruct it in the context of prevention, always with the qualifier, I am not a prevention scientist. You have that expertise at a far greater, greater level than I do. But I do believe we share a common goal of helping people in a way that changes the trajectories for their lives, that changes the way in which they are coming to the door. I had the, the privilege of joining many of you in sessions over the last two days and listening to the impact of trauma, the impact of substance use, the pervasiveness of mental health need, all of that comes to discussions around access. Who is actually coming to the door? Some people come all the time. Some people never get there. So we've had a conversation within SAMHSA because there was a rub when we were trying to explain prevention and then take it apart and people saying, well, this is what we do and this is what you're asking. They're not the same. So for those who are familiar with the Partnership for Success program, this is literally a, a snapshot of some of the, the conversations and it, it's helping us see 
that they are prioritized populations and some of that comes with the, the grant program. Then we look at the high need communities. Many of you are working in those communities. And then we ask you to take one more step. Within that community that you're working with, who is most likely to not be at the meeting, at the forum, participating in the education activity that you work so hard to, to create? All those that promise to come and don't, that's who we're trying to reach through this effort. Some have done it through a needs assessment. And in that needs assessment, looking at data, both in terms of high need, but also those that are frequent users of the resources. Others are looking at population trends and working with state data, local data, data to see exactly who's there and who's not. But we also wanted to go a little bit beyond who gets to the door. We want to look at what sometimes influences who comes, who stays, how long they stay, and whether they come back. Issues of affordability, availability, whether or not when you come, you feel welcome and accommodated. The session I went to earlier today that had a very graphic photo of a, of a residence of someone that was struggling and they were not in recovery, but they were struggling trying to get there. And you could tell the disarray. So if you're leaving an, uh, an environment that is just complete chaos and then you have to figure out how to get to another space, how does that influence access? And what do we need to do differently about that? And when you get there, are you feeling accepted just where you are and how you are? Sometimes that changes across populations and the culture that's there. So these next slides are going to be pretty, pretty quick, only because I want you to, to appreciate some of the data sources that SAMHSA's um, produced of late. We're changing our displays somewhat, and we're starting to look at our data the way we're asking you to look at your data which is also nice. It's not just asking you to do something differently. This strategy requires us to do something differently as well. And here it's looking at changes in illicit drug use for adolescents. So the one point that I want as a takeaway here, just look at the lines where the lines go down. And then there's one group where the lines go up. So whether you're a data geek, which I'm not, or not, you see there's a difference. So in this slide where the, the lines go down, it means that those populations are improving. They're doing better. They're using drugs less. That's happening for all but one. So for us, we would want to know what can we do differently for the group where use is not changing and at the same time, make sure whatever we're doing that's working well, where there is improvement, it doesn't stop. Because if we're not careful, you can create a disparity and we don't want that to happen. Same thing here. Looks like everybody's doing better. All the lines are going down now. But we also wanna ask, in 2010, something happened. Everybody was doing well except for one. So if we were at that point in time, we'd want to better understand what's going on. Maybe this has to do with race and ethnicity, maybe not. Maybe it has to do with all of a sudden there was some natural disaster in a particular community and those groups of people couldn't get to something. That could create a disparity and we want to know, do we need to pull in our partners from transportation or housing to help make service availability and accessibility different? We look at differences both in terms of gender, 
we look at differences in terms of economic support. And also here we, we want to say, well, is it the substance that makes a difference? Do we start to look at disparities, not only sex, gender, race, ethnicity, but also ease of access? So it's not just service access, but it's the substances that people can get a hold of and win. So all of these are just examples, data, snapshots, clearly available for you. But this one, I think we don't always get a chance to talk about. Where poverty and health intersect. So my first day here, I listened to someone talk about their community and, and ways in which poverty, issues related to poverty, were really impacting service quality and availability. And we want to make sure that everyone knows how to think about that and where there are questions because there are many questions about how to improve those conditions that we start to leverage partnerships in a different way to begin to have answers. So now I stop at a program example. This is a real example of program data because sometimes when we say look at the data, look at the data, it's uh, thank you very much, but I've got like 30 people sitting at my door and you're saying I should stop and look at data. Not practical, not realistic. So we ask people to create pictures. So at a snapshot, we begin to see the distributions of populations. But we don't want to stop here. Sometimes it's not just race and ethnicity, but it's also the intra-group differences. Because we were doing language translation, we cannot always do one language or translate it in one way. We have to think about idioms and the nuances there. Sexual orientation sometimes makes a difference in terms of who comes to the door. And in this case, I wanted to stop for a second because this particular program, they figured it all out. And then they got to this particular set of data. And they realized that they had focused a lot of attention on the largest group of people, but it was the smallest group that was causing the greatest challenge. It was the smallest group that was constantly in and out of the emergency room. And when they did that bottom line look at the end of the month, this was a group that was costing the most in terms of staff time, emergency room use time, and had the, the least uh, success with recovery. And it was because of language access. People really didn't understand how to communicate with them or how to move forward with them. So I just want you to put that example in the back of your mind for a moment as we move into use. The use efforts are looking at quality improvement and ways in which we have conversations. It's not about, oh my gosh, you didn't get it right. It's about, oh my goodness, we did get some things right, but we're missing some other pieces. So how do we think about that and use our data? How do we look at data that is available, this again on SAMHSA's website, that talks about why people don't use mental health services. What do people actually think about in terms of recovery? What are the beliefs and how do those beliefs vary across groups? Some think recovery's not that hard to accomplish and others are struggling with that. Also, who can be supportive and when? So how do we make sure that when you are looking at your communities and the populations that you're reaching, that we are doing it in a way that's consistent with what they believe? So this was just my eye opener to say, wow, we're a pretty diverse nation. And it's easy when we look at large scale maps, but some of these ethnic groups are within communities and their heritage, their traditions make a difference. 
We want to look at where we're going as a nation. We talk about the changing faces of America. But we don't always talk about the fact that America's face has changed. It's not something that's coming in 2060. It's something that's happening now. And your state is particularly diverse and has a large immigrant population, which is a great opportunity for us to test out some of what we think and what we know. It also allows us to look at the national class standards. By show of hands, how many are using them in your work? Okay. This is a great opportunity because the class standards are aligned with the way we do business. So I always say you can do standards two through 15 and you will automatically do number one. If you do number one, you will have done the rest. Number one is an overarching standard and it requires thinking about all the other areas in terms of training, workforce, language access, which is huge, huge. And now we want to think about accountability as well. I heard a number of people talk about the benefit of working with communities, but also making sure we're giving communities the information back. So it's not just learning from them, but sharing back with them. Very important. SAMHSA has also taken steps to create a blueprint similar to what's here that focuses on behavioral health because this particular version has a lot of healthcare examples, but not necessarily aligning it with the work that you're doing. So we want to make sure that we have something that's as relevant as possible as we're asking you to be relevant. So again, going back to that program example where they were looking at the language and why uh, they were so challenged in how they were reaching people. This is how they used the class standards. They looked at each one and carved out some strategies, not just to leverage the class standards as a framework for doing the work, but also a way in which they could create something that could be institutionalized, a way in which they could start to train, learn, but not have to always train and learn. You want to leave something behind. So looking at recruitment strategies, looking at ways in which you can create um, toolkits or in this case, a toolbox for staff, ways in which the, the learning about the population that they were reaching, which in that case were Russian speaking immigrants, how they could make sure that people had the information particularly when it came to their interface with their primary care and behavioral health care providers, translating a lot of the instructions and the materials into the language that they could understand. When we get to outcomes, this is really critical. You see the class standards leveraged again. This is a point at which the partnership with you and SAMHSA has been the most dynamic and exciting because this is where we are learning and we are changing. Um, within the, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, I give them credit always when we're talking like this because they have um, been able to listen, but also create products to, to think about strategies. So we go one step, they go two, and it, it allows us to have tools in front of the work but also have tools that are informed by the work. So if there's something that you're, you're challenged with or something that you've actually created an innovation around that you'd like elevated, um, that's something we'd, we'd really like to know more about and, and, and to partner along with you in, in bringing that to the forefront. So all of this is to say, we'd start with that question, what if we started our conversations around health equity? Well, we know we're not quite there yet. We're not really there with understanding all of the disparities. But we are at a point of conversation saying that as we are looking at the broadest need, the highest need, we also want to look at sometimes what appears to be the smallest need so that we balance it out so that everyone has equitable health outcomes. 
This is a, a slide that says, indeed, the um, Partnership for Success program. They've applied this strategy starting in 2012 and looking at exactly the intersection between looking at disparities, promoting health equity, and prevention. And how are we thinking differently about engagement? How are we thinking about education and screening? And how are we thinking about the reduction in recidivism and, and the reduction in higher levels of care so that people can be at a place that's the least challenging and painful for themselves? The, this example, my working example, they also had some early wins. So they recognized that they had more than one population they needed to focus on. But in focusing on all of them, wanted to be very mindful of training resources, ways in which they were recruiting and hiring, but also on the back end to make sure that as they were learning about the people that they were working with, that they also had opportunities to think about recovery across settings. We're displaying data differently here with tobacco use, looking at improvements, but not consistent. This one, looking at the cost of care going down. And in those environments where health care costs are drivers for who comes to the door, this is where prevention is so essential that we get it right. We know that some states have expanded Medicaid and some chose not to. But at the end of the day for a family, it probably doesn't make that much difference if you can't afford the deductible or you didn't get the access to health insurance in the first place. What really matters is that we are better able to prevent those conditions that are most difficult. So this is one of my favorites. If we know all of this, and I do believe we know a lot, why are we acting like a cracked egg society, putting Band-Aids, constantly putting Band-Aids? There's some reason for it, but I do believe in collaboration, we're gonna change it. We're going to look at stigma differently and we're going to minimize, if not eliminate, quickly, quickly. We also know there are other barriers and these barriers influence access. They influence how people perceive problems. Sometimes that perception is what will get someone to the door or keep them far away. And we also know that sometimes we still have to cross that great divide between what we know that works and what people tell us works. Not always the same thing. I heard a lot about trauma while I've been here. This is simply a reminder, not an in-depth discussion of trauma, but what interrupts health. Violence and trauma, absolutely, but where does it touch? This slide gives you an idea, but I also reframe the question to say, where does it not? It's very pervasive in its influence and how it manifests. And out of all the reasons that we want to understand it, the primary one is so that we can be more effective in how we work with people. Within SAMHSA, there is a concentrated effort, not only to understand trauma, so there is a concept paper that we've produced, but to embed that understanding in a public health framework. Many of you have seen uh, funding opportunity announcements and, and ways in which we are trying to offer resources for communities, but we also want to think about how we measure change, how we think about the, the training and the strategies. There is a toolkit that is, is currently under development so that we can think more strategically about the learning in that doing. Also, in terms of access to healthcare. This is beyond what you see on TV. It's about understanding what it really means and that it doesn't mean the same thing for all people. Certain states are more vulnerable than others, certain populations more vulnerable than others. And when you look here, it looks like certain groups are pretty good. 
So I ask you, just look at the slide, uh, the, the bar that focuses for the Asian American population. Not doing bad when you look at what access to health insurance. But then if we look again, that intra-group variation. Many of those people are in your communities. So depending on, on the slide that you choose, you see, oh, we're doing good there. But if you go just a step further, maybe not so much. And maybe we have to understand again how to elevate prevention in a cultural and linguistically appropriate manner so that we're reaching all people. We are moving forward. We're moving forward in a good way. And we want to move forward with you very seriously. This is a way of looking at social determinants of health in a way that says health equity is one of those outcomes if we get it right. If we better understand the engagement of those who are most vulnerable along with those who are considered the least vulnerable so that everyone has equity as a goal and a framework. How do we make sure we're looking for service capacity enhancement? Before I got on the plane to come here, I was told very clearly that Ohio has worked very hard at building capacity. I don't think anyone understands how hard you actually are working. But there is a difference in your outcomes. So whether they know it or not doesn't really matter. What matters is that what you're doing is very effective and it is working and that there's more to do. And that's why training and technical assistance is important. This type of convening, very important. Leveraging the resources we have, also important. And then I get to this one, which is my most important slide. So if per chance, lunch, weather, and my voice has taken you to that very mellow place, <laughs> wake up because just from that early canvassing of the audience where I asked how many were funded by SAMHSA, not too many hands went up. So now by show of hands, who is not funded by SAMHSA? And because I was anticipating that, this slide is for you. My office supports a network, it's a virtual network for community-based organizations and their partners to provide training, resources, a peer group, and a repository of best practices that are evolving from communities for those who are not SAMHSA grantees, not SAMHSA grantees. It costs nothing to join. It costs nothing to stay in. The benefits are high. So return on investment, very high in this one. This is the National Network to Eliminate Disparities in Behavioral Health. We call it the NED because there's just way too many words, honestly. But I encourage everyone in this room, grantee or not, to join this network so that you can be aligned with others who are doing similar work, so that you can get information as it unfolds about the resources and ways in which other communities who are doing similar work are making progress and that you can share your progress with them. I think for us, we understand without the connection, without the opportunity to learn, without the opportunity to be affirmed in the differences that you make, your day is just too hard. So we offer this as a way of saying, it's the best we can do, may not be as good as you might like, but it's the best we can do in this moment and encourage you to share with us as you move forward, to think this key opportunity, this time, this moment, as the opportunity for thinking about the policies that you're implementing, the policies that you are developing, ways in which prevention are key, 
and how we can be mutually accountable for supporting the communities that you're working with and all those across this country. I thank you for your attention. I really appreciate the knowledge that is in this room because I know just by osmosis, I'm gonna leave a little bit smarter. And if there's anything that I can do or any information that I shared that wasn't clear or needs a little expansion, please don't hesitate to email me. There is a website at the bottom that gives you access to the resources through my office and just wish you all the very best in the work that you're doing.